what I like the most about the Arduino-based DCC-X system is the modular approach. Starting with a simple Arduino controller, you can stack up power boards or even a lock on it board and the system can literally grow with the requirements. Unfortunately, not that much is available when it comes to enclosures. So I thought it is time to create a modular housing system that, like the electronics, can be configured as needed. Welcome to the IOTT channel. My name is Hans Tanner and I'm glad to see you. Welcome to all the new subscribers and welcome to everybody else. Let me start with showing you how this enclosure system works and it's really simple. I start with the base, which is the lower half of the enclosure of the Arduino board. It has openings for the Arduino USB connector and DC jack. And on the bottom it has locator pins to fit the Arduino Uno. Next I put on the base frame. It fits on the top of the base, either loose or it can kind of click on depending on the tolerances of the used 3D printer. Even if it is loose, it is held in place by the 2mm overlapping lips. At the upper end of the frame there are supports for the PCB to sit on. My next PCB for this build will be a standard Arduino motor shield, so I install it on the Arduino headers and press it down until it sits on the support structure of the frame. Next I place the motor shield frame over it and press it onto the base frame. I then connect all the wires I need for the motor shield, so main track, broke track and possibly DC supply power depending on the setup. Then on top of the motor shield frame I place the blind cover and the first simple command station build is complete, almost at least. What remains is locking the frames so that the stack cannot fall apart. I will show you how to do that a little later in this video, but first let's have a look at what frame types are available and how you can download and print them for yourself. I have created the enclosure parts based on the Arduino case designed by Sigmund Wojcik found on Thingiverse. You find all the new design files you need to print the enclosure on Tinkercad. Go to tinkercad.com and enter the keyword IOTT cube or simply IOTT and you will get a list of all available modules of the enclosure system. Each enclosure module is structured in the same way. It is titled with the name of the module and inside you find all parts that belong to it. Each part is shown in a separate color and if two parts have the same color that means they are different variants of the same part. For example, here in the cube base design you see two versions of the base, one with and the other without screw pads to screw the base to a control board. Furthermore, there are design elements to create a horizontal color streak in case you have a 3D printer with dual extruder. I will show you a little later how to download and print these elements, but first let's look at the various modules. The first one to look at is the IOTT Cube base module. As seen before, it consists of the bottom part and the base frame. The bottom part comes in two versions, one is just the simple bottom frame, the other version has pads for screwing the finished command station to a desk or mounting it in a control cabinet. The frame part is the same for both versions. There is an alternative base version for the Arduino Mega. 
called IOTT Cube Mega Base. Like the standard base, there are two versions of it, one with, the other without screw pads. Then there is a frame part that goes on top of the Arduino side. Note that this frame is not identical with the frame for the standard Arduino base. It has some more openings on the right side for the additional I.O. pins of the mega board. Then there is the blind cover for the larger board space of the Arduino mega. This part has two versions, one with openings to access the GPIO pins of the mega, the other without those openings. The cover can be screwed onto the base using two M2 by 10 mm screws. The next frame type is the IOTT cube motor shield frame. It can be used as enclosure for the standard motor shield. It is a simple frame with just an opening to conduct the six wires for DC supply, main and broke track to the motor shield board. To install it is best to first plug the motor shield on the Arduino stack, then click on the frame and only then connect the wires through the opening in the frame. If you plan on using the new IBT2 power shield instead of the Arduino motor shield, you will use the next frame, which is the IOTT Cube IBT2 power shield frame. It has the opening for the DC supply and track connectors on the right side, and on the left side there is a smaller opening to connect a single wire pair to the DCC output of the board. This output can be used to connect DCC to the Red Hat shield if it is used, but it can also be used for example for a DCC test track or a programming track. You should not use this output for your main tracks though, as the PCB traces are not made for more than about a half an amp continuous current. The nice thing about the IBT2 power shield is that it is using connectors for DC supply and track output, so it is easy to connect and disconnect the main wires at any time, in particular when the whole stack is assembled, something that is not easily possible with the standard motor shield. Sometimes it may be beneficial to add some space between individual boards using an additional set of spacers. To adjust the enclosure, you can use the IOTT cube header frame, which provides just enough sidewall so that you can place the next shield on top of the headers. To finish the IOTT cube, you can use the IOTT cube blind cover. Like the side cover for the Mega Cube, there are two versions. One that is just a flat cover for the stack. The other version has openings to access the Arduino headers. The opening is wide enough to fit jumper wires and on the other hand the slot provides a certain protection against bending and breaking of the jumper pins. The last module that is currently available is the IOTT Cube Red Hat Shield cover. It consists of two parts. The first is a special version of the spacer frame, since the Red Hat Shield is best installed using an, an additional set of spacers. In comparison to the standard spacer frame, this one has openings for the LED pigtail on the right side and for the growth port cable for the LocoNet connection between the Red Hat Shield and the IOT heat stick on the left side. The second part is the cover for the Red Hat Shield with openings for the LocoNet sockets, the DC power plug, the DCC connector, jumpers and the IoT stick. It furthermore has openings for the Arduino pin headers, so if you want you can connect here additional IO pins, for example for block detectors and the like. To install, you first place the frame part of the enclosure of the beneath shield, typically a motor shield or IBT2 power shield, then install a set of extra header pins and the red hat shield on top of it. Make sure the LED pigtail goes in the
Install the 50 mm growth port cable and the DCC connection wires to stick and connect the stick side of the growth port cable and your LocoNet command station is ready to go provided you have uploaded the DCCX software to the Arduino. Now let me show you how you can get a copy of these enclosure modules and how you print them to make your own IoT cube. First use your browser to open the tinkercad.com web page and log into your account. If you are new on the page, you will be asked to create an account. This is necessary so that you can store a copy of the design files in your own account, where you can modify them as you want. It is not possible to make changes to the files while they are still in my account. They are read-only. You can join and log in with your email or with your Google account. Once you are in, click the Copy and Tinker button to copy the module into your own account. Now you have the option to just print the module as I designed it, or you can make changes to it as you like. Let's first do an example of just printing it. Printing is basically a three-step process. First, you need to create and save an STL file. Then you load this into the slicer software that you use with your 3D printer and create an object file in the printer language. And third, you print the data from that file. Let me demonstrate how it works. To create an STL file, you click the model you want to print. Then you click the export button. In the dialog window, you click the STL button. You are then asked to name the export file and select where to store it. You then open the slicer software that you normally use with your printer. In my case, I am using Ultimaker Cura. Once it is up and running, you can load the STL file into the slicer software. You can move it on the build plate to the location you want it to be printed and also change other parameters of the printout like the temperature of the extruder or the hotbed or the printing speed and so on. For PLA filament I normally just go with the default values for most settings, maybe I just increase the printing temperature by a few degrees. Then you slice the model, create the printer data file and load it to your 3D printer either via SD card or maybe you can send it to the printer via Wi-Fi. You then start the print and some time later your model is printed. The printing time depends on the amount of material and the number of layers that have to be printed. And of course it is also a function of the technology. I am using a Lotmax FDM printer with two extruders so that I can print in two colors and I usually print the models using PLA filament. With that technology and material I am experiencing the printing times for each module as listed in these tables. Now let me show you how to print a module with two colors since I really like the option of adding a nice look to the enclosure. It makes the process of preparing the 3D data a little more complex, but I think it's worth the effort. To make it work, we need to provide a separate STL file for each color to the slicer software. And the data in the STL file needs to be complementary, meaning that what you want to be printed in the second color must be a cutout in the model for the first color. What I have included in each module is a cutout and a color part to create a horizontal color streak of 1 mm height. I normally use it to mark the bottom of the frame, as you see here, and I use different colors for each frame type. To create the STL files, I therefore have to make a cutout for the color streak in the frame I want to print, and then create two STL files one for the frame and one for the color part that fills the void I just created.
Also, as I learned the hard way when creating the STL files, the parts need to be in the correct position with respect to each other, or the slicer software will misplace them. So, here's how I do this. I place the frame I want to print and the cutout for the color streak on the work plane and center them. Then I combine the two parts which creates the frame with the cutout. Now I create the STL file for the frame and save it. I then separate the cutout from the frame and convert it into a printable solid part. I lift up the frame to get access to the color frame and I export it into an STL file as well. Normally I use the same name just with an underline C for color at the end. That way it is easy to recognize what belongs together and which file has which data. When done, I load both files into the slicer software and place them in the area of the work plane where I want them to print. Then I select the extruder I want to use for each part and then I select merge. This combines the models together and they also get relocated according to the settings found in the STL file. Note that the slicer software also creates a purging cylinder to empty out the extruder when doing a color change. This cylinder keeps growing while there are two colors in the same layer. And that is the reason why I normally place the color layer at the bottom of the frame. Now the object file is sent to the printer and the frame gets printed. When using two colors printing slows down a little bit but not dramatically. And it is quite funny to watch how the printout develops. When done, this is how the part looks like. If you don't have a printer with double extruder, you can of course also print the various frames in different colors. I really like the idea of printing the command station in the colors of the railroad company I am modeling. And I am for sure looking forward to see some pictures of your designs. After printing all needed modules, you can assemble the command station as demonstrated at the beginning. Then you are ready to secure the build and make sure it can't fall apart. There are two ways to do so. One is the proper way for quality minded people. And then there is the quick and dirty way. The proper way is inserting an M2 threaded rod in each corner. The holes in the blind cover and the red hat cover are made to screw in an M2 rod. Just turn it in to the end, but do not over tighten. Cut the rod to the length needed for your particular combination of frames, put everything together and secure it at the bottom using a washer and a nut in each corner. Add a drop of hot glue to secure the knot against becoming loose. I like the solution, but not necessarily the cost, so I thought about a cheaper way. I decided to add some sort of a loop and hook system to the base and to the cover. It is basically a half cylinder tunnel and it is possible to run a thin wire, either steel or copper, with a diameter of about 0.5 mm through it. Do that on the top end, then run both wires to the bottom of the stack where they exit through the other tunnel. Now hold the stack together and twist the ends of the wire to tighten them against the half cylinder. Cut and bend the ends towards the inside of the tunnel and the system is closed. Not as elegant as the threaded rod solution, but quick and low cost and it serves its purpose.
metadata files and not just the printable STL files like you get them for parts you download, for example, from Thingiverse.com. Well, one reason you have already seen. Each model is basically a frame kit from which you can create several variants depending on your requirements. The second reason is that you can do entirely new designs for frames I did not think about supporting. For example, you may want to use a Wi-Fi shield. This is something I will most likely not support as I am using the Red Hat shield with the built-in Wi-Fi of the IoT stick. But based on the Tinkercad files it will be easy for you to create your own enclosure module. Simply copy one of my frame designs, disassemble it and reuse the core parts to create your own frame based on the dimensions of the Wi-Fi board you plan to use. So, be creative and come up with your own designs. I am looking forward to see some pictures, of course. Finally, what can you do if you like the concept but don't have a 3D printer available? Well, one option is to have the files printed by a commercial 3D printing service. And I will also offer the enclosure modules in the Tindy store, so you can order them from there. A link to the store is in the description of this video. And that's it for today. I hope this information was useful or at least interesting for you and you are now motivated to upgrade your DCC X command station from the electronics freak level to something that remotely looks like a real product. The quality and performance of the DCCX software inside certainly justifies giving it a better look than just bare-bone boards. And as always, if you like this video, please let me know and click the like button below. It helps to promote this video and the IOTT channel in general, as YouTube likes the likes. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.